Can you hack a virtual machine? A virtual machine is a place where you can run pretty much anything, and in theory, you should be okay. At Pwn to Own, a hacking competition, four zero days just got dropped for VMware, and they're pretty nuts. Also, yes, my lighting is new. I'm trying to be more on brand with hacker culture. Purple, I guess, if you like that, say nice lights in the comments. Okay, anyway. The Zero Day Initiative, an organization that's trying to basically make zero days go away, uh, runs this contest called Pwn to Own, where every year they announce different targets, right? Hey, this year we're gonna target Chrome, Windows, and Hyper-V, right? And people will go out and try to find bugs in those software, and then if they find vulnerabilities and things that they can actually exploit that software with, they can register for this competition and go and show off their exploits. And if they work, they get paid. The total payout for Pwn to Own Berlin, just one of the Pwn to Owns, was $1 million, just over $1 million, with a single research company getting 35 points and therefore $320,000, pretty lucrative, now, the bugs that were exploited there are in a variety of softwares, but the ones I wanna talk about are in VMware products, in particular ESXi, Workstation, Infusion, and multiple tools on top of that. The reason that I like to focus on virtual machine vulnerabilities is A, because they're sexy, but also there's this, there's this premonition, there's this, this notion, I think, in security that if you run it in a virtual machine, it's safe. And while that is generally the case, I want to explain what a virtual machine actually is and how these exploits work because virtual machines are safe, but they're not perfect. So this is your computer. It's a red square. And that's the end of the video. Nice, thanks for watching. No, uh, so this is your computer. Uh, the way that a virtual machine works is effectively you make a fake computer inside your computer. This is a CPU, it is a processor that is running and it is hosting software on top of it. Now, what we can do is we can make this thing called a virtual machine, which is basically another computer inside of your computer, right? It's another CPU inside the CPU. So on the outside of, your, of this computer, on the outside of your virtual machine, there may be the Windows operating system, right? Pretty straightforward. But maybe inside of this virtual machine, I wanna run Linux. This is virtualization. It's this entire field of technology that allows me to run some software in a less privileged state using sandbox technologies in the CPU on top of other software. The software that allows you to do this is called a hypervisor. There are multiple kinds of hypervisors. But basically, when you have your computer turned on, you are running the Windows operating system, right? The Windows OS, pretty straightforward. Now, inside of the Windows OS, you run other programs. Pretty straightforward, right? Not that complicated. Well, one of those programs can be this thing called a hypervisor, which is the software that runs that allows a fake computer to exist inside of your real computer. One of those hypervisors is known as VMware Fusion, right? Now, this is the type two hypervisor, which means that it runs on top of your OS. There is another type of hypervisor called a type one hypervisor, which basically runs right on top of bare metal. So instead of there being windows underneath, the entire OS is this thing called VMware ESXi. But basically we are able to use these to make fake OSs live inside of a real OS. This gives the hosted software the sensation that it is living in a real environment, but it's actually being supervised by a hypervisor to make sure nothing sketchy happens. Also software that's running inside of this hypervisor can't get out supposedly. Enter these four bugs, okay? The way that this works, and it's really not that complicated, I think VM escape vulnerabilities kind of scare people, but the nature of how they work is not that complicated. Hypervisors are just code, and anything that has code can have vulnerabilities. So as a result, at Pwn to Own, there were three critical CVEs and one not so critical CVE and in information disclosure in the code that runs inside of VMware. One of them in the VMXNet3 uh, network adapter, one of them in the VMCI, uh, the VM communication interface, basically it's like a bus messaging system for VMs to talk to the hypervisor, and then a heap overflow in the paravirtualized SCSI, like the hard drive interface controller software of the hypervisor. Now, how does this work, right? How, why, why do these pieces of software exist and how does this work from an attacker's perspective? At the end of the day, a hypervisor is just software. And what does software do? It allows human beings or other software to interact with hardware. Ultimately, every piece of software that you touch is just an interface to an interface to an interface to turn a pixel on in a screen or to make an RF wave go over the air, right? All of it just makes hardware happen. And for a hypervisor, that is the exact same thing. These hypervisors have these things that allow a virtual machine to think it has access to real hardware, but it is actually just virtualized hardware. The first one we saw is the VM XNet interface, right? If you are in a VM, ultimately, you will need to be able to write to the network. 
And there has to be a piece of code that takes your inside the VM data and pushes it outside of the VM into the host OS and eventually down into the hardware. Now, VMCI is this interface in VMware that basically allows the hypervisor to alert the VM of different pieces of data, right? It's like, hey, uh, you are being granted access to a device. Like if you do like a USB pass through, there has to be some way to inform the VM that that is happening. And the VMCI, the VM communication interface is the way that you do that. Now, the hypervisor can send the VM messages and obviously the VM can send the hypervisor messages. And again, because the hypervisor is just code, if there are vulnerabilities in that code that can be exploited by the VM. This one is going to be an integer underflow. An integer underflow is a really interesting thing in computing where let's say we have a number that is set to zero. It is an unsigned integer, which means that it cannot carry negative values. Well, if it can't carry negative values and it's already zero, what happens if we hit a branch of code that doesn't check for it to be zero, but then decrements it? We have maybe uh, the length of a packet, and if it is zero and we take away some data from it, we decrement that length. Now the length, what happens? It underflows, which means that it actually wraps around to the top value that a number can represent. So an int in this architecture is a 32-bit integer. So by subtracting one from zero, we've actually made it so that now it is the biggest value that it can be. Now what I'm assuming here, and again, the pox for this are not public yet, what I'm assuming is that an index value was used to index into an array by subtracting one from that value when it was zero somewhere, you wrapped around to the top end of that value. This may have been able to be used to turn into a, an arbitrary write vulnerability. You can use that index to now write outside of the bounds of your array. If for example, we took this I value and now said array of I, this is going to index outside of the array and I can use this to put malicious values places. Now, because of the nature of how these interfaces work, most of the time, the network adapters are actually ran as drivers, which means that they run not only in the host OS, they run in the kernel of the host OS, which means that a vulnerability here allows the user to put arbitrary data inside the kernel of the host. So you are not only going from a VM to the host machine, you're going from a VM to the host kernel. Crazy, scary vulnerabilities. Now an integer overflow, is we have this variable i. Maybe i is the length of a packet. Obviously you wouldn't call it i in that scenario, but just bear with me, okay. Now, what happens if we set i to the maximum value that an unsigned integer can contain? This by default is a 32-bit value. So the max number that it can be contained there is this value here, 4294, you know, I'm not gonna read it, but, but that value. If we were to increment i, we would overflow the integer. But what happens there? It's actually pretty interesting. What happens is the value overflows to zero. So what if this logic here is being used to handle the length of a packet received on the VMCI interface? It has some already large value for the length. It adds maybe a header length to that value. That overflows, and then they check to see, is the length bigger than our max value? Because it's overflowed to zero at this point, that check would pass. Again, we don't have the vulnerabilities actually written out, but this is generally how these kinds of bugs are seen in the wild. And then finally, the pair virtualized SCSI heap overflow vulnerability. So SCSI is this pretty old at this point interface for dealing with hard drives. You know, there's SATA and there's SCSI. SCSI came before SATA. When you look at your dev SD blank uh, devices in Linux, for example, these are devices registered with the kernel that interact with a driver that handles that hard drive, right? And so back to our original model, if we have to do something with physical hardware, there is likely an interface that touches a driver in the host kernel, right? So if I were root in uh, this VM, which I can be because I'm in a VM, right? I'm in a privileged context. If I do this, if I wanna change some property about this hard drive, there are a variety of admin commands that I can run on that hard drive that will inform the hypervisor and then the host kernel to do something with that device. Like I wanna maybe change the size of a partition, I wanna rename the device, et cetera. If any of these things, again, because all this stuff in the hypervisor is just code, has a vulnerability, we can exploit that heap overflow. Heap overflow is what it sounds like, right? Basically, you have this heap allocated buffer, you have some length associated with that buffer, so the buffer from the heap is only 32 bytes. If for some reason you fail to associate the data that you copy in with the length of that buffer, you do a, a copy or a mem set that's bigger than 32, you know, an attacker can put more data in that buffer and ultimately cause the data of the heap to get corrupted. 
Now, the way you can exploit this is by this thing called the metadata corruption, right? The glibc heap, the heap that's used in the libc allocator, the pt malloc allocator, has a lot of um, protections that make it very hard to do this, but not impossible. So for example, if an attacker were able to overflow on this line here and put arbitrary data in the heap, what they could do is free that data in a way that adds it to a list of known freed chunks called the free list, but then when they go to malloc the data again, they get a different pointer back from the heap. This, the world of allocator corruption is a whole other world for a whole other video. But basically by putting specially crafted data that is overflowed in the heap, they can return arbitrary pointers from the heap some of the times and use that to corrupt the system and gain arbitrary code execution. Very interesting stuff. Oh wait, I almost forgot, hold on. <laughs> Sorry guys, I almost forgot the most important part of the video. Give me a second. Would Rust have fixed this? Ah, the age old question. Does Rust actually make software safer? Uh, yeah, guys, I mean, these are pretty standard issues in software that a memory safe language like Rust would have fixed, unfortunately for, I guess, VMware, but fortunately for the future of software. And there are some caveats though. So Rust, by default, will in debug mode catch an integer underflow or overflow. For example, here, we have this variable x, its value is zero. If I call the function reduce on it, that just subtracts one from it. I did that so that the compiler can't detect it at compile time, there's an underflow. If there's an underflow that occurs here, you'll see that in normal mode, so cargo run, the by default binaries in Rust come out as debug. This will run the binary in debug mode in panic because of that underflow. However, if I run this in release mode, the binaries overflow does not get caught. Now, while the release versions of binaries written in Rust would have not found these overflow or underflow vulnerabilities, it would have detected and prevented against the likely array index out of bounds, right? The whole point of a memory safe language is that you can't do like array of 50,000 if 50,000 elements are not allocated, right? Uh, so again, information disclosure via uninitialized variable, heap overflow, and then the accesses that come from integer underflows and overflows would have been caught, but the overflows and underflows themselves not fixed by Rust. So at, on a zero to 10 of not fixed by Rust, fixed by Rust, I got a high seven. It's pretty good. And with all that put together, you have the uh, screenshot here of the gentleman at Pwn to Own escaping from within a VM out to the external host, and they have a uh, NT authority system on the device, which means not only are they outside of the VM, they're in the host, they are the authority of the kernel, like almost in Windows, the top authority that exists in Windows, which is really, really crazy stuff. Also, if this security research stuff interests you at all, or you want to get more involved in it, check out the link in the pinned comment below. You're going to like the way you look. I, that's not, Go check out the link, please. Again, now, how likely is this to happen to you? Okay, probably not that high. Uh, this is not a thing that you should be, I think, sitting around worrying about as like an IT infrastructure manager. I do think it is important to know that these things exist, but as long as you're keeping your software updated, you're updating VMware Workstation, you're updating ESXi, it's unlikely you'll be targeted by these. These are vulnerabilities that are extremely hard to pull off just because of the complicated nature of finding a way out through these interfaces. And also you're relying effectively on two memory corruptions. You're relying on a memory corruption within the hypervisor itself, and then using that to do a memory corruption in the host kernel, all while not crashing both pieces of software. Not impossible, but very, very difficult. Anyway, guys, I do appreciate you all watching. I love you guys. If you like these videos, hit that subscribe button. I really do appreciate it. And then uh, go check out this video on a similar topic. This happened recently with VirtualBox as well. We'll see you over there. Mm, goodbye.